Hello and welcome. I'm Malika Kapoor, Global Deputy Editor at Bloomberg Live, and I am so pleased you can join us for this, the Sustainable Business Briefing Accelerating Climate Action. Climate change poses both risks, but also opportunities. And many business and finance leaders have embraced climate action as an opportunity, providing innovative solutions that are creating a positive impact on both their businesses and also our planet. In just a few minutes, you'll hear from sustainability leaders from business, finance, and nonprofits who are working hard to accelerate climate action. But before we get to those conversations, I'd like to thank our sponsor, EY, for helping making this event possible. And now I just have a couple of housekeeping rules to go through with you so you can enjoy this program. Tech issues. If we have any, and we might, this is a virtual event, please bear with us. And if you're having trouble with the audio or video quality, just refresh your browser. You can also restore windows using the buttons at the bottom of your screen. And remember that the size of each window is adjustable. We do want you to participate in this event. We want it to be as interactive as possible, and we do welcome your questions. So to submit a question, type it into the Q&A box below the slide window and click Submit. Remember to include your first name and tell us where you're writing in from, and we'll do our best to give you a shout out if we manage to get to your question, and we'll do our best to do that. We're also going to be polling you throughout the event just to make sure that you are paying attention. And the poll questions will pop up on your screen as we're talking, so do pay attention to that. Social media, we are active on social media and we'd love you to engage with us. So please do so using the hashtag, hashtag Sustainable Biz Summit. And with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Leslie Kaufman, to kick us off with her conversation on how businesses can collaborate for change. And that features the CEOs of the Climate Group and We Mean Business. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just adjusting my computer, so I'm still in the center of it. Um, this is Leslie Kaufman. I cover uh, business for climate uh, for Bloomberg I'm on our sustainability team. Before we get going, I think we're going to start with a poll just to get everyone um, to start thinking about these issues. And here's the questions. What do you believe is the most effective for accelerating climate action? Our choices are policy incentives, coalition building, investor demand, Commitment from business. So let me just read those one more time. We'd love for you to vote. What do you believe is most effective for accelerating climate action? Policy incentives, coalition building, investor demand, and commitment from business. Now let me uh, introduce our two guests today. We are very lucky to have two women who are deeply knowledgeable on the summit the subject of climate and business and getting businesses to engage. Um, First of all, we have the CEO of the Climate Group, that's Helen Clarkson. Uh, the Climate Group also is, works with um, We Mean Business, which is a larger coalition group. And we're also very lucky to have Maria Mendeluce, he's the CEO of We Mean Business. Maria, I hope I didn't butcher your last name. Um, in any case, welcome both of you. We're delighted to have both of you. Um, so I think where I'd like to start today is obviously it feels like 2020 was in some way a watershed year. And I don't know whether other people feel that way for business engagement. It started with BlackRock um, and it's gone all the way through to lots of very impressive net zero pledges, China being one fabulous example, but also Walmart. So I was hoping we could start off with each of you talking a little bit about your work uh, and and what you think about 2020, where we are, is this been a watershed year? Maria, why don't we start with you? Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, 2020 has been definitely a decisive year, uh, I think for climate, not uh, uh, for unexpected uh, reasons. I think uh, through the COVID pandemic, uh, the world has realized that actually the climate crisis is, is, uh, is could be biggest, uh, bigger than the, the COVID pandemic and that we need to get ready. And that as we uh, build back um, through stimulus packages, we need to make sure that those are uh, deployed uh, in solutions that can help us uh, create jobs, uh, uh, boost the econo economic growth, but also reduce emissions. 
So I think that that has been something that has it was quite unforeseen, and now we're going to see in the European Union 500 billion dollars being spent in stimulus packages on climate change, which was not expected. And so I think, um, yeah, for the wrong reasons, maybe because of COVID, uh, climate action has accelerated both from a company perspective that we're going to talk a lot, but also from a government uh, priorities and investment perspective, which is definitely, you know, both are going to be very positive for, for climate change. And Helen, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I think I mean, it's interesting. How, how do we think about 2020? So, you know, when we are at Climate Week, one of the things that the Climate Group does is we run Climate Week NYC every year. We come together in New York. And last year in September, we were talking about the climate decade, that we've got to halve emissions across the 2020s so that by 2030, we've halved emissions. So it was always going to be a really big and important year for the climate. Um, and we were sort of gearing up for that. And it was going to be a really important UN uh, discussion in December, the COP that's going to be in the UK. So we were looking at a COP a lot from a UK point of view. And then, of course, COVID came along. And I think the initial thing was a kind of what will this do on the climate? Does it put all of that back? We know the science tells us we don't have time to wait. We can't put things back. Uh, I think a lot of us working in the environmental movement remember the financial crisis in 08, 09, and the, and the kind of the story then was like, don't talk to us environmentalists, you know, let's get back to business as usual, then we'll come back to talking to you. And so like, is that going to happen again? And actually what we've found is pretty different. So we work with over 350 businesses and we polled them back in sort of April, May. So first sort of wave of the crisis and said, well, how does this affect your climate plans? And over 96% said, doesn't change them, still really, really important. There was also polling around the same time of, you know, the general public, what do you want? We don't want to go back to how things were. And I think what we're starting to see is an understanding of the amount of money that's got to go into economies now. How do we get out of this economic, you know, recession, depression, whatever we're going into, biggest economic crisis in decades, and a much better understanding that there is a way to spend that money in a way that helps achieve climate goals. So governments are starting to talk more smartly. Businesses are saying, we still want to do this. In the same poll, over half the business, around half the businesses said, we want to do this, but we need more government support. And I think what we're seeing is this really interesting emergence of some kind of consensus finally that there's a way that you can tackle the environment and jobs in a kind of cohesive strategic systemic way right i think when so joe biden who's a candidate for democratic uh the democratic candidate for president here in the united states has certainly linked climate and jobs in his green stimulus plan um the european union has certainly done that as well are we seeing that Globally, do most countries or most uh, unions have a chance to do that globally, or is that really something we're just seeing in the United States and Europe? Uh, Maria or Helen? I think it's broader. I don't know if Maria's got a sense. You know, we heard it in the UK just yesterday. Um, it's conference party, uh, party conference season, they call it here, where all the political parties sort of set out their stall for the next year. And Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, was talking about Build Back Greener. Um, it's it's certainly picking up. We've seen it. You're right. We've seen it particularly in Europe. Um, we've had sort of bailouts being attached to things like the aviation industry saying, right, there's got to be conditions on those. So these ideas are starting. I think it is reaching into Asia for sure. We've seen um, we run something called the RE100 campaign, which is a commitment to 100 percent renewable electricity. Um, by companies. And that's been actually name checked in, uh, I think, the South Korean recovery plan saying business is right, you've got to join this. So we're seeing all parts of the globe as they start to think about this, we are seeing pick up. I wouldn't, I don't know if it's how universal it is, but I think it's interesting, as you mentioned, um, China, we're seeing increased ambition coming. And, and, I, and I'd say the other way, we're not seeing sort of the breaks on it that we might have thought. And so that's good to see. Maria, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, well, I think in addition to what Helen has said, I mean, some of the, the countries, developing countries, of course, do not have the resources to invest uh, and they just need to get out of the COVID crisis. But what is happening in, in China, Europe and the US, uh, if Biden wins the election, then it's quite positive because you will have a positive uh, um, 
impact in the deployment, large large scale deployment of technologies, bringing through economies of scales the cost down, and then developing countries will benefit from that. So, so I think uh, some countries are leading, and others will also benefit from from it. Well, they will benefit, but also taking into consideration that some countries are also providing goods and services to the developed countries. So, so I think it's all positive. Well, so we're seeing a lot of pledges from very big companies. Um, I guess I have two questions along that line, and we can take them one after the other. The first would be, are these companies actually, uh, are these real pledges, do we follow up? I mean, obviously they're great, they're great PR, but what mechanisms do we have to effectively follow up? And do we want companies making pledges that basically are far beyond their technological means right now. And then I think afterwards we can talk about the role of small and medium-sized businesses because we hear a lot about big companies, but there are also some small and medium-sized, lots of small and medium-sized businesses, and we need to know where they fit in this. So let's start with the big corporations. They're saying a lot of the good things. Do we feel confident that we have the mechanisms in place to follow up to make sure that they're doing what they say and that there is the technology that they can do what they can. Do you want to start, Maria? Sure. Oh, I was going to say, why don't I start on that? And Maria will take the um, SMEs. I think she'll do, she will answer that better than me. So I'll, I'll leap in on this one. So okay. for the companies that make commitments, you know, at the Climate Group, we run these big commitment campaigns. RE100, I've already talked about. EP100, which is a doubling of energy productivity. And EV100, which is about corporate fleet commitments on electric vehicles. Right. And with all of those, we check in every year on how they're doing against those commitments. So it's not enough just to make the commitment, you're right. We then need accountability and we follow through and we both do data gathering exercises. We partner with CDP, who are a big data gathering NGO, another NGO in the Women Business Coalition on the RE100 data um, in particular to look at how are they doing on, on um, renewable energy. And then we gather the other data with other partners we also then go to the partners and say well, what is stopping you go faster you know what are the barriers so we've got qualitative and we've got quantitative data and then we particularly share then the, the good news stories so we look at where a company is doing well and we use a sort of positive reinforcement mechanism to show where are things happening where are things going faster use that to give other com uh, companies confidence to make commitments. But we are looking across the piece at how is everyone doing? Is everyone following through? And making sure that we only showcase really and push those companies. Um, we push all the companies, but we showcase particularly where companies are hitting their targets ahead to sort of keep you know, accelerating the story. Um, what we have seen in reporting as well, I think where companies do it really well, where they publish their own reports, is where they do admit where they're not hitting targets. And I think Unilever have been a company that's absolutely outstanding on this, is being very clear, we're hitting these, these and these targets, these are targets we're not hitting. And that really helps, again, people understand that picture. On the technology thing, we definitely want companies making commitments where they don't know how to get there. That's what leadership is, and it's not empty because what we find is when you set that big, audacious goal, particularly when it comes from the CEO, that gives a very important internal signal within a company that this is what we're going to do, and it really opens up the space for innovation. And I would say, if you know, if you make a 90% commitment, every one of the company thinks that they're in the 10%. It's like, oh, it's nice we're doing that, doesn't apply to me. When you make a 100% commitment, you signal across the company, we're all doing this. And it's really critical, and we see a big success when CEOs get behind it. So things like the big Walmart announcement we had a couple of weeks ago, Climate Week, you know, you've got the CEO of Walmart, the biggest company in the world, making a big commitment. There's no way that we're not going to follow up and check that he delivers on that and hold him accountable. Well, we should talk about how you actually hold people accountable. But Maria, in the meantime, did you want to sort of talk about when a Walmart makes a commitment, of course, it's not just for them, it's for the entire supply chain. So I was thinking maybe you could weigh in on the question of how you include smaller and medium sized businesses and everything that's going on. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, and, be, and before going there, I think what's important uh, to note is that when companies are making these public announcements, they have been 
work through the company, through the different committees until they get to the board of the company. So actually companies are not putting commitments out there just the, because they feel it's the right thing and PR strategy. I think there is a lot of um, debate, a lot of discussion within the companies and a lot of question inside the companies. If we're going to go out with these uh, targets and we're not completely sure on how we're going to get there, how are we going to respond? Are we going to be criticized? So sometimes, uh, you know, when I when I look at the criticisms that I hear, I say, well, I think we should focus on those companies that are not doing enough, because it is arguably understandable that some companies do not know whether their clean products are going to be sold. I remember an example from IKEA when she, the CSO, she told me, listen, when we came with the electric vehicle um, target, we we didn't have a clue on how we were going to do it. And then five, let, they, five years later, they had achieved that target five years in advance. Okay, right. so I think you just need to to trust them that once you put the leadership behind, and that leadership is through different committees, that the company is going to push as much as they can, and sometimes they will face barriers, and that's where the Climate Group, WBCSD, BSR, and other companies of the coalition are working with those companies to remove some of the barriers. But it's not they're doing it with the best intentions to meet what we're doing. That doesn't mean that we should not hold them accountable and make sure that they report regularly on progress. And this is something that we need to do. Now, coming to the uh, SMEs, as you know, uh, big multinationals, most of the emissions, the scope three emissions, 90% or more, come from the supply chains. So uh, for any company, for Walmart, Amazon, you name it, and you will see it, you know, it is fundamental that they engage with SMEs. And that's why the, the Women Business Coalition, together with ICC and Experiential Roadmap, launched this, uh, the SME Climate Hub. This is because we want SMEs to also commit to climate action. We want to have a million SMEs, it's quite aspirational, to commit to climate action. We want to provide them tools, and also we want to provide them incentives. So we want the big multinationals to tell them, you also need to be aligned with Net Zero. Well, that's very ambitious. I just want to say that we're getting some audience questions and I want to share them with you. Uh, there's a question from Rebecca in Houston and she asked if Helen can provide a link to the poll she mentioned. Uh, and then, uh, Yes, I don't know how to do it technically, but they're publicly available so we could, there's, there's, someone can make that happen, I'm sure, yeah. Okay, uh, we'll have to figure out how that technically can happen. And then we also have a question uh, someone says, Michael Mann said at Bloomberg Green that we only have four years to avert climate disaster. Do you believe that that's true? Helen? I think, yeah. Oh, Maria? Well, I can, I can take this one. Yeah, I think we, we need to, to reduce uh, in the next decade the emissions by half. This is removing 27 gigatons from the atmosphere uh, that, that are not released. Uh, uh, and so that in itself is quite a big challenge. So, I mean, uh, Michael, it's right. If we don't uh, set the, the, the direction now, we are not going to achieve that. And then it's very difficult to, to achieve the, the Paris Agreement. So the next years are fundamental. The good story is that we are going to inject, uh, at least in Europe, 500 billion and hopefully uh, trillions in the US um, towards uh, clean technologies so that we can get there. Okay, um, I'm looking for our poll results and I'm trying to pull them up just so that we can all, I just wanted everyone to know how people uh, um, thought, but it looks like 42% think that policy incentives is the right way to go. Uh, only 23% think investor demands make a difference um, and 25% think commitment for business. So I think that it's pretty clear that um, policy incentives oh and only eight percent think it's coalition building so i think we're we're all pretty clear that governments have to provide policy incentives uh to move forward um if you uh if you were thinking of the policy incentives you'd most like to see from governments uh, and we only have five minutes left so maybe we can each do a brief answer what would you most like to see uh helen yeah, I think it's interesting to see that because my answer to that poll was, well, you've got to do all of that stuff. And I think to, to link that to the Michael Mann point just made, these are the absolute critical years for the climate. Halving emissions by 2030 
and then getting down to net zero by 2050. We've got to do all of the above all the time and at great speed. And so for that reason, when you think about things like policy incentives, we look a lot at the interaction between markets and policies. We bring together these big demand side commitments and then we use those both to sort of say to the supply side, if you think about something like electric vehicles, say to the suppliers, you need to provide more vehicles. The demand is there and give the suppliers the surety that the market is there. But also say to governments, look, if you change these policies, actually you will accelerate the market. So for electric vehicles, we've been pushing very hard for an, uh, bringing forward the end date at which combustion engines will be sold. A lot of governments have set a 2040 date we're campaigning to bring that forward to 2030. And it's those sort of incentives where you can see that the businesses are leading on this agenda, are making these big commitments. So understanding how you can help use policy to shape markets, to allow businesses to achieve what they need to do. I think that's the that's the virtuous circle that we think a lot about. And so designing policies like that. And I also say, encourage people not just to think about the national government or the federal government we work also with state and regional governments and looking at what you know california and others are doing and how they're shaping markets and setting the right policy incentives there is really important as well okay so we uh, the virtuous circle is a very important idea maria we're going to give you the last say we only have a uh, two to three minutes left so what do you have to say if we had to do policy initiatives um and keeping an eye on the virtuous circle uh, carbon tax, the terribly named carbon tax, but uh, what do you, what would you like to see most happen in the next uh, six months? Yes, we have done a study uh, to, to analyze how to invest and provide incentives through the, through the stimulus packages. And there are five measures uh, that we have included is investing in renewable energy, on the grid, on electric uh, vehicles, on energy efficiency and natural climate solutions. And the one and the winning winning one is invest in electric vehicles. So provide incentive scrappage schemes where we, we, we replace internal combustion engine cars with electric vehicles. And those bring the best uh, results in terms of job creation, GDP, and together with renewable energy deployment, uh, deployment on uh, GHG emissions. I think we should not forget natural climate solutions. They bring a lot of jobs, economic growth in local communities that are very much hit by COVID and also produce a large amount of, of emission reduction. So, so when, when governments uh, look at incentive, inevitably they need to look at, at how to optimize the three elements that I mentioned, jobs, economic growth and GHG emissions. Yeah, I think there's obviously a lot of uh, opportunity to do that. So um, I think we're running out of time. Um, I wanna thank both of you very much for uh, joining us and for participating in this and for all the work you do, bringing people together on this topic and, um, and helping work through this. So until we meet again, this was terrific. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And nice to see you, Helen. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. And now I'd like to introduce our next two speakers. So please join me in welcoming the Managing Director of Engineers Without Borders Norway, Maria Nielsen Stumer, and the Global Vice Chair of Sustainability for EY, Steve Varley, for the EY Sponsor Spotlight Climate Action in the Field. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Steve Varley, UI's Global Vice Chair of Sustainability, and I'm joined by Marianne Nilsson Sturmeyer, Managing Director of Engineers Without Borders Norway. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Steve. Over the last year, Marianne's team has worked with several organizations on a project called Waste for Warmth which is bringing life to an incredibly innovative solution that has the potential to respond to several global issues at once. Plastic waste, fossil fuel usage, lack of decent work, and housing for refugees, and climate change displacement. At EY, we are constantly looking out for ways to scale technologies and business models that protect and regenerate the environment, while also unlocking economic economic opportunity. One way we do this is through EY Ripples, 
our global corporate responsibility program, which puts forth a vision to positively impact 1 billion lives by 2030. Through EY Ripples, we're helping to increase the effectiveness of the Waste for Warmth project. Mariam, can you tell me a little bit more about the project and how it's tackling so many problems at once? Yes, thank you, Steve. So, um, simply put, the Waste for Warmth project is an innovation project. We are developing a model using waste to locally make insulation products for warm and safe shelters for refugees. And the insulation is made from recycled plastics using a technology called polyfloss. And uh, as you say, we are tackling several problems at once. Most importantly, the very urgent problem of warm shelters for refugees living in tents in cold and often very harsh winters. We tackle this by making local production lines for insulated sleeping bags, floor tiles and tent liners. And uh, today there are millions of people living in temporary shelters. There are 3.6 million Syrian refugees in Turkey alone, a record number of 26 million refugees worldwide. Uh, we are currently focused on deploying in the Middle East refugee camps. And then also worth to mention is that the number of displaced people due to climate change will most likely dramatically increase. The most common projection now is that there will be an additional 150 to 200 million people displaced by 2050, unless we act to address climate change. And uh, this model also addresses an environmental concern as the insulation products will be made from recycled plastic. It's a great example of circularity. And uh, in addition, insulating tents in refugee camps is a cleaner and less energy intensive way to provide warmth than other typical options. And finally, uh, by basing our model on local production, we also want to create jobs and activity in uh, refugee camps and host communities where Lack of opportunities is a real concern. It takes a psychological toll for people living in these insecure environments, often over many, many years. So tell me more. Tell me how bad is this plastic waste problem and how can this model be scaled to address globally? Yeah, it's uh, plastic is not an easy material on the environment. We produce more than 300 million tons of plastic each year. Globally, less than 10% of all plastic is currently recycled. In uh, refugee camps, we see that plastic waste builds without relief. There is no system for handling it. Uh, however, it's also fair to say that plastic has some unparalleled qualities like long life, the potential for reuse. And uh, there's a huge supply of it that has left the value chain. So we also want to create a circular economy around plastic waste. And uh, the production also allows for our products to be dismantled and reused or melted to make uh, new products. And we certainly think that this model can be scaled to address the plastic waste problem globally, though it's also safe to say that there is not one single solution that will solve everything. Uh, the polyfloss technology can, of course, be used for other applications. Uh, we believe there's definitely a commercial market for the technology as well, and that for sure it can have a strong impact on plastic waste as an industry. So I know this is part of a major collaboration. So how are the organizations involved working together for the Waste for Warmth project? Yeah, so we are four organizations working together. We work with the International Federation of Red Cross, Shelter Research Unit, uh, Field Ready, and the Polyfloss Factory. And uh, I'd say that together we have complementary expertise and experience in relevant areas such as uh, engineering capacities, developing refugee tents from inside the gigantic humanitarian aid complex. And uh, in this project, uh, we have found uh, common motivation and uh, commitment. Thank you, Marianne. And how has EY Ripples helped to move the project forward? Uh, I'd say maybe our biggest challenge is to make this a financially sustainable business model that is scalable and replicable. And in order to do that, we have to be able to calculate cost and resources and also to uh, visualize impact. And uh, through the EY Ripples program, EY has allowed us to benefit from their knowledge and experience and is helping us develop a resource model. And the model allows us to uh, simulate different scenarios for how to set up production. Um, it helps us to understand possibilities for economy of scale. 
it allows us to identify the biggest cost drivers in the production line and to show and quantify both direct and indirect benefits. And uh, it's a really valuable tool for calibrating the business case. Uh, also help us understand who we further need to partner with and uh, visualize impact towards uh, stakeholders. And then EY is also assisting us with drafting an IPR agreement for the project. It can be complex when four organizations work together. We need to strike a balance between our common wish for access for humanitarian sector and private companies need to protect their intellectual property. So uh, I'd like to add that we are, of course, happy to have established such a good relationship with EY and uh, going forward, we hope to continue working together towards building a better world. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, but I know you've also faced other obstacles, so maybe you can share those with everybody as well. Yes, uh, so uh, one of the main reasons why humanitarian organizations don't prioritize innovation uh, is lack of funding and donors often stringent requirements. Innovation is messy, it's neither fast nor easy, and to be successful it's necessary to be allowed to trial and error. Uh, for now we are very lucky to have an extremely flexible donor, the publicly funded Innovation Norway, that allows us to reprioritize as needed, and uh, the project is funded until October 2021. However, we need to build a business case and be able to clearly communicate impact in order to raise more funds for next year and for scaling, which again is why EY's ongoing contribution is uh, so important to the project. And then uh, COVID-19 obviously has posed major disruptions throughout the world. Uh, for us, travel restrictions uh, have been a major setback on exploring and establishing local partnerships, uh, on gathering data in the field, and uh, also working with physical product development. Our workshops take place in actual workshops. So traveling even across Europe and to share that space is a real challenge. And then we are facing all sorts of technical challenges in the product development, but obviously as it is an innovation project that is to be expected. And what does the future look like for this way, Marianne? What impact could it have in the world? Well, we started in January this year and it's still early days. There are a multitude of factors to be worked out. Uh, by October next year, we uh, aim to have proven the concept. And uh, I am optimistic that we will by then be ready for a scale up in time to help refugees have warmth for the winter and decent work opportunities. And uh, I'd, I'd say the potential impact is as big as the problem. How many millions of refugees face a lack of protection from harsh winters? how many tons of recyclable plastic is out there. Uh, this project can directly impact the lives of millions of people who need protection uh, from the cold, uh, while at the same time creating jobs and tackling climate change. And then to be successful, innovation projects will require different sectors and actors working together by pooling resources. And uh, in the aid sector, we need the commercial sector to enter into partnerships, both with finances and to use your know-how and experience to help solve the common challenges. And to get there requires the vision, the willingness to take risk and a can-do attitude. But uh, yeah, to wrap up for the Wasteful Warmth project, uh, our key success factor is developing a scalable and replicable model if scalable, there is a great potential to generate impact and return. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, Marianne. It's been inspiring hearing about the project and how it brings together technology, sustainability, and partnership with business for an important humanitarian purpose. I wish you and the team the best of luck in the future and look forward to seeing what more we can achieve together through EY Ripples. Thank you, and let's speak again soon. Thanks, Marianne and Steve. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague Akshat Rati for the next session, which includes conversations with business and finance leaders who are driving climate change. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Akshat Rati, and I'm a reporter with Bloomberg Green. Uh, in this panel, we have uh, experts who will talk to us about how business can accelerate climate action. Uh, and with us, we have Kate Wilson, who is the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Vail Resorts, 
Philip Engel, who's the Vice President of Sustainability at Orsted, and Daniel Shuri, who's the Vice President of Sustainable Finance with the ING Group. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists uh, an opening question first uh, as a way for them to introduce their own company and their own work, uh, but to also answer this key question, which is how are they in their businesses accelerating climate action? And maybe first we can start with Philip, because at Orsted, uh, the process has been probably faster than in many other companies. Uh, Philip. Yes, it uh, it certainly has been been fast, also faster than than we thought it would have been. Uh, at us, still, uh, we have transformed in a decade or so from being totally based on fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, to today being totally dedicated to green energy. We've done that by closing down our uh, coal plants. We have divested oil and gas, and we have built up an offshore wind business and have actually become the, the world's leader in offshore wind. At the same time, we are focusing a lot on onshore uh, wind and also solar energy and, and storage. And, and, and what we've done over the years, I think our biggest contribution in accelerating climate action is probably to, to take a lead on developing offshore wind as an, as an industry. And, and that has been very much by, by setting uh, ambitious targets. Uh, let me, let me share a story with you. I remember more than 10 years back, I was in Brussels was at a conference i just just graduated from from college and uh, i remember there was a conference on how to go green the european energy system and at that point offshore wind was really a niche no one thought it would be really anything and i remember people talking about how these turbines who were sort of quite small back then um how could they possibly be scaled and there was no one who really thought that that could happen uh, one of the reasons why that you didn't have ships big enough to take the turbines and install them uh, offshore. That was true back then. So that was seen as an insurmountable challenge to scaling the industry. Now, where are we today? We have turbines that are six, seven, eight times as big as back then. What have we done? We have, we have built bigger and better turbines, obviously, in the industry. And we've also built bigger ships so we can install those turbines. It's just a small anecdote. And, and it seems today obvious that what we would do was just to build bigger ships to challenge, to, to overcome that problem that I, I just mentioned. But back then, sort of no one could really see how could you do that. And I think that's really illustrative of, um, of the challenges here that we have with scaling. It's about, it's about creating um, scale through technology, technological innovation above all. And we have this tendency to think that, that uh, technology, technological development happens incrementally. But but uh, and, and very linear, but it happens a lot uh, through leaps, and it really does so. It really helps a lot if you set those targets, uh, and I think that's a really important point for uh, for when you talk about about scaling. Um, it's uh, we scaled offshore wind much faster than we thought. We also thought it would take a long time to bring down the cost of offshore wind, but by scaling the technology, we had a lot of technological learning. And through that, we managed to, to bring down cost of, uh, of electricity of offshore wind to make it cheaper uh, in, in much faster than anyone thought. So, so just between 2012 and, and 17, uh, the, the, the price of offshore wind fell with almost 70%. And today, it's, uh, it's cheaper to build offshore wind and coal and gas fired power plant. The same goes for, for onshore wind and, and solar, by the way. And I think that's, that's really a key point to, to remember here that, that we do not have a technological problem. We have a, a scaling problem. We have yeah. the technologies we need to, to go from fossil fuels to green energy. Sure, you need to develop and further refine uh, some technologies. That's for sure. But we really have the brunt of it. Now it's about scaling. And Kate, uh, in your work, you should tell us about how you're doing uh, accelerate, acceleration on climate action, but also you've had the pleasure of working with Orsted in some of those uh, activities. Yeah, we have. So at Dale Resorts, you know, we are a leading global mountain resort operator. We have 37 resorts in 15 states and three countries. And uh, in, we've been on a sustainability journey for a long time. You know, officially we started uh, working on sustainability in 2006. Uh, and in 2017, we announced our commitment to zero. So that's our commitment to a zero net operating footprint by 2030 across all 37 of our resorts. Um, and so within that, we have a commitment for zero net emissions, zero waste to landfill, and zero net operating impact to forests and habitat. 
Um, and so, yes, we have made significant progress since announcing that goal in 2017. Uh, we were able to collaborate with Orsted and just this June, um, 82 turbine wind farm came online. Uh, the Plum Creek Wind Project, we're really, really proud to have uh, helped enable that project to come to life. And uh, once it's operational for a year, um, next summer, it will address more than 90% of our North American um, scope two emissions. So we're really excited about that. Um, and, and that puts us, you know, a really, really significant way down the path for our uh, RE100 goal or to have zero um, electricity emissions. Uh, we've also you know, made great progress in terms of our own operations. So commitment to zero, you know, we feel we have an op we have um, a, a real opportunity to address, you know, emissions and, and climate within our own our own operations. So then uh, that's where the zero waste to landfill piece comes. Um, you know, we had a goal to be 50% of the way there uh, in terms of in, in, by the end of 2020. We're releasing a report later this fall that will provide uh, an update on where we are in that goal. And last year we were at 44%. So we've made massive progress. Uh, and you talk about accelerating accelerating change. And I think, you know, I'd like to highlight two partners we work with there as well. So we feel like, you know, it's great for us all to, to have really bold sustainability goals. And we absolutely need to do that to protect these places where we live, work and play. And at the same time, we need to partner with our communities and, and have strategic partnerships um, in able to move everyone forward. So um, this year we have partnered uh, with PepsiCo on a really exciting initiative to um, recycle uh, chip wrappers and snack wrappers um, and to be able to turn those into through TerraCycle um, through uh, to Adirondack chairs and patio furniture that you'll see in our Colorado resorts uh, this winter, which is really exciting, as well as a terrain park feature in Breckenridge. And then also, you know, working with Helen Hansen, um, you know, they have been doing amazing stuff with sustainability and innovation around fabric. So we feel like, you know, working together and partnering and pushing each other um, is is really important part of that of that acceleration for us. Right. Um, and then none of these things are going to happen without being able to access capital. Um, what at ING have you been able to achieve that has helped accelerate climate action? Hi, that's that's a great question, and and I think Philip really hit the nail on the head when he when he talked about the need, the need for scale. And we look at the the IEA's models around what is going to be required for for a Paris aligned future. Uh, they're estimating around 30 trillion euros of, of additional investment between now and 2035. So as you said, there's going to be a lot of need for capital and that's something that ING has been thinking about for, for a number of years now. So really, it, it's, it's a multi-stage approach. There's, there's multiple things that need to happen from a financing perspective uh, to, to get to where we need to, to be. I think number one is that uh, the, the, the financing institutions need to to look at themselves to make sure that their own footprint is is, is in line with the, with the Paris space future. And we look at IG, we've been climate neutral since 2007. So it's, it's very good to, to talk the talk, but we have to walk the walk ourselves. Uh, a second phase is, is thinking about what we don't finance. So uh, putting a kind of an exclusion criteria on certain uh, sectors, certain activities that will never get us to where we need to, to go is, is also very important. And ING, again, was, was the first bank to uh, uh, announce an exit from coal financing and very strict around um, uh, who we work with from the utilities to make sure that their future is indeed Paris aligned, um, as well as to, you know, not including any new additional coal. And then the third stage, really is around what we do finance and that's where we see ING can make the most impact. Um, it's, it's not so much looking about the, the, the kind of the carbon past of, of investments and, and, and companies, it's more thinking about what we can do to finance the technology and innovation to get them to where they need to go. And, and that's very complicated. So you need to look at every single sector, you need to work out exactly what each sector needs to do to be able to align to a Paris-based future. And then you need to look at the gap, the technology gap and, and the financing gap uh, to where companies are today versus where they need to go. That's where we get really creative and then we can really help you to understand um, where the gaps are and what the need is. Uh, we use things like uh, thematic financing, so we look at green bonds, uh, sustainability bonds, and, and, and more recently sustainability linked loans and bonds as well as ways to incentivize, incentivize corporates to, to really get on track to, to Paris. Right. Um, and sticking with the uh, point about sustainability linked bonds, these allow you to be able to move the company on, overall on their targets uh, that you set with them. What are the criteria and, you know, in numbers that you are setting to be able to lend this money uh, to them? And how do you 
ensure that those criteria are actually accelerating uh, climate action? Uh, that's a fantastic question. And uh, we saw the introduction of the sustainability link bond principles just this summer, um, actually, which is, which is setting a good precedent to, to the kind of requirements uh, for this, this brand new, this brand new type of, of, of sustainable financing instruments. And, and it comes down to, to, to really two things. It comes down to selecting the appropriate KPIs. So when we talk about a sustainability link bond, let me, let me take a step back and, uh, and explain what it essentially is. It's, it's a general corporate purpose financing mechanism. So you don't need to finance specific projects, green projects, as you would with a green bond. However, um, the, the characteristics of the instrument are tied to certain KPIs um, being met. In other words, for example, if, a comp if an issuer has a KPI around greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the future, if they do meet that target, um, then, then typically the characteristic might stay the same or, or, or we might see an improvement in their favor. If they don't meet that target, then the financial characteristic might um, work against them. It could be, for example, a coupon step up. So it becomes more expensive from a financing perspective. So the two key elements here are, are, are selecting the appropriate KPIs and, and they need to be material to the business. So it needs to be something that's particularly important and particularly um, material to the sector that they're in uh, and speaks to the change that needs to happen within that sector. So for a carbon intensive sector, it needs to be around carbon. For, for a waste intensive sector, it needs to be around waste. So the selection of the material KPIs is, is, is important. And then the calibration of that KPI as well. So making sure that the target that has been set is calibrated with a science-based approach. That's really important to ING. And in fact, we were the first bank to, to, to look at science-based approaching uh, to our financing or to our, to our lending portfolio. Uh, it needs to basically move that company within that sector in line with what is required and what has been scientifically proven to be needed in order to meet certain targets like two degrees Celsius warming, for example. Right. Um, and I'm going to take a audience question here, which is for Kate, but I want to just give a bit of background, which is in time in, to, in defining emissions from, from companies, there are three types. There's scope one and two, which Kate mentioned, which is direct emissions that are generated either from the operations or from the electricity producers that provide the power to operations. But there's also scope three emissions, which are emissions either uh, created by customers uh, or through the supply chain. And the question is, uh, does Vail include in its commitment the emissions associated with guests traveling uh, to the resorts um, and the housing uh, associated with the guests staying there? Sure, I'm happy to address this question. So uh, commitment to zero specifically, it addresses scope one and two emissions. So we felt like um, in launching our goal, we had, we had the biggest um, impact in our own operations to start with. Uh, however, we do also operate uh, transportation, uh, the Epic Mountain Express, and so that is included. We also do have our own um, housing and hospitality and hotels and retail stores, and that is all included as well. Um, and then I would say, you know, within, within our scope one and two, right, that gives us the focus, uh, at least in the first couple of years, to be able to do things like, you know, put in 400 low energy snow guns, to switch out 11,000 LED or lamps to LEDs. Um, really, really focus on, we have, we, are, we have committed $25 million between 2017 and 2030 to address energy efficiency and energy reduction of our scope one and two. So that's really important to us as a starting place. That does not mean that scope three will never be part of, formally a part of commitment to zero. Um, and again, we do own a lot of, a lot of the lodging where our guest stays and that, that um, if, if we are able to control it, then it is in our, uh, that is within our boundary. In terms of, uh, you know, sticking with sort of uh, the ability for, for companies to be able to accelerate, one thing that we've heard and we heard in the previous panel as well was policy matters a lot. Um, and maybe, Philip, you can talk about uh, the process through which Oster, you know, apart from setting ambitious goals, also was able to tap into this uh, support that governments gave in this crucial period uh, for, for offshore wind. And, and now we're seeing results, right, this week, we had uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, announce a really ambitious goal to put out uh, 40 gigawatts worth of um, offshore wind turbines, which is, you know, almost three times as much as has been installed in all these years. Hmm. Yes, that's a, a great question. And, and, and I think, obviously, societies, governments and societies have 
played a huge role in making the cost of green energy come down and making it cheaper than fossil fuels. It would not have happened without the investments made from society in subsidizing uh, the uh, the sort of first uh, years, if you will, of the the, the life of. Um, of, of green energy and 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 that is uh, that is instrumental and 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 what we see today then is that we also need to start shift uh, the focus because now it's 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 less about sort of subsidizing the development again it was a question of scale if you want to bring down the price of something you need scale how do you get scale well i mean investors developers they look at it and and they they can make the business case uh, so so that's why you you have needed governments to step in and, and, and support in that phase. And, and now we're at a place where, as I said, it's cheaper. But now we also need to make the switch because now it's much more about looking at the policy around development of different types of green energy and also on the demand side. So so when we talk about we all need to take action um, and act now, that's really important. But uh, it's sort of, you could almost rephrase it a bit and say, you know, what's really important is also how do we act and then how do we act on policy? So let me give you one concrete example. Today, when you want to build offshore wind in the North Sea, uh, you have different uh, uses of the sea, of the space, obviously. Military being one, uh, fishing industry, transportation, what comes last in the order of uh, of sort of priority here uh, when the member states of the EU do their uh, spatial planning, that's green energy, that's offshore wind. So, so you want to sort of look at your policy setup and find a way to integrate offshore wind uh, in the same way as you do with other industries. That's just one example. So it's, it's sort of this much more sort of nitty gritty policy that we need to 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 turn to to really get the, the green transformation going because it is a bit of a paradox that on one hand we have more and more companies committing to uh sorry more and more countries committing to very ambitious climate action and you just mentioned boris johnson and the uk's very ambitious um announcement here and on the other hand you have a lot of finance available uh really and on and, and thirdly you have green energy technologies that are actually cheaper than fossil fuels so why why isn't this happen automatically well for many reasons but one of them is that there are a lot of sort of a lot of local issues around a uh, development of green energy projects and also integrated into the grid that are hindering uh that development so that's where we should also really start to turn our focus to right um, i'm also going to take another audience question uh, we have a question from preeti in the netherlands uh, and that's a question for dan and she says asks what is the role and importance of sustainability, sustainable development goals in sustainable financing? You know, you talked about uh, science-based goals, which uh, are largely looking at the Paris Climate Agreement uh, as the basis to be able to set a um, set a, a trajectory for where emissions need to go. Uh, but the UN also has sustainable development goals, uh, which are key if we need, uh, you know, developing economies uh, to to become as developed as developed economies are? I would say two things. Uh, firstly, sustainable finance is not just about climate action. And there's, of course, uh, a priority in terms of uh, climate change and carbon uh, climate mitigation. Uh, but sustainable finance also covers social aspects as well. And, we, and we've really seen the growth of, of that social um, aspect of sustainable finance in the past year or so, particularly with, with the crisis starting at the beginning of the year. So the SDGs can be very useful from that perspective uh, because they cover all, all matter of issues uh, from economic growth for, through to education and healthcare as well. And, and these are all equally important elements of sustainable finance. So the SDGs help to underpin um, all matters of environmental and social positive impact. And the second thing I would say is that um, the SDGs help to provide a very good context to, to the, the sustainable finance instruments themselves. So rather than just a company issuing a green bond, say, for example, uh, as a standalone instrument that really doesn't bear too much resemblance to the company's corporate strategy, to its long term commitments, its long term sustainability objectives, the SDGs help to map uh, that sustainable finance instrument to the aspirations of the company, essentially who they are as a business and, and what their what their kind of their underlying goals are uh, from a sustainability objective. So the SDGs help to provide real context to to the rationale behind sustainable finance and, and the long term objectives there as well. Right. Um, so we're coming towards the last five minutes. Um, and I thought a, a, a really nice way to end this would be um, to 
perhaps give maybe one or two things maximum uh, that you really would like to see happen uh, in the next five years uh, in this space to be able to uh, meet some of your own goals, but also maybe take them a step forward. Uh, and maybe we can start with Kate. So do, uh, sure. do you want to- that's a great question. Yeah. So, you know, the way that we think about, you know, climate, yeah, um, sure. So the way that we think about climate action at Vail is really, you know, we have to set these really bold goals. Um, and you might not have all of the answers for exactly how you're going to reach those when you set them. So rather than having companies think about, oh, what's the next thing we can do? What do we think we can achieve? It needs to be flipped on its head. It needs to be, what will it take to solve climate change and setting bold goals to that level and then partnering with your communities, with your, with other companies, with government, with cities, uh, so that we all move forward together. And I think, so for me, I think it's really about taking bold action um, and not being afraid of that and 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 looking at what will it what will it take to mitigate climate change rather than incremental steps that that, that folks think they can do it's time to think big and bold and and take that action and work together uh, to figure out how we'll get there right and philip you were hinting at some of the problems that are sort of becoming a bottleneck for the growth of uh, offshore wind, you know, what are the one or two things that you think need to be fixed or upgraded to be able to make that happen? So, I mean, I, I, I sorry, I wish it was it was only a couple of things. It's, it's a lot of things to be done. Uh, I would actually like to broaden it, not just to focus on offshore wind, because that's only a part of the solution. Um, I, I think the most important thing to do to really accelerate the, the green transformation, that is what we've talked about a couple of times throughout this conversation, and that is to set ambitious targets. Because if you set those targets, the markets will also help deliver. You know, the markets are a very forceful engine of innovation and action. And it's about what direction do you want that engine to run in? Uh, do you want it to deliver green or do you want it to deliver fossil fuels? What do you want it to do? If it's green, then set the, the targets. And then, as I said, uh, there's a lot of other more, more near sort of policy stuff that you also need to get, also needs to get going. But, but those targets are really, really important to, to keep on, on pushing. Um, and same question for you, Dan. Yeah, I think I think uh, I really agree with with both the comments before. I particularly like what Kate said. I think it's around t turning the market upside down in many ways. But when we when we talk about green finance, one of the questions we get all too often is, well, what's the reward for doing this? And and incidentally, we do see um, a consistent premium um, in in the issuance of, of green bonds in some cases that we think might be because the fact that the, the bond is green, for example. We, we can't say that for sure, but we, we, we do think that that could be a, a deciding factor. However, I think the key question that we need to see developed in the next five years is, is not what is the reward for doing this, but what is the penalty for, what is the financial penalty for not taking climate action seriously? And when we get to the stage where, where the, the, the financial markets are thinking more along those lines, then we know that we've made serious and, and, and decent progress on this space. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, all of you, uh, Dan, Philip, and Kate, for an engaging conversation. With that, we wrap up today's session, today's Sustainable Business Briefing, Accelerating Climate Action. Thank you to all our speakers for their time and their insights, and to you, our audience, for joining us. We do appreciate you making the time to do so. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, EY, for helping making this event possible. Remember, please follow us at Bloomberg Live and check out our website, BloombergLive.com, to find out more about our events. We have a packed schedule through the end of the year, and we'd love you to join us for future events. And we hope you can join us for the next Bloomberg Sustainable Business Briefing. That's on November 5th, and that's going to be focused on empowering the workforce of the future. I'm Malika Kapoor. On behalf of the entire team at Bloomberg Live, thank you for joining us and stay well.